How are you guys doing this morning? Thank you, Dana. I heard Dana, right? Because he got the, the mediocre good. Um, I was uh, given the scripture reference, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 7 and something. 7 through 11. There it is. So um, I thought like everybody was doing 1 Peter chapter 4. I didn't look at it. So like the whole time Dana's speaking, I'm reading like 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm like, where is he? But anyways, <laughs> I realized towards the end it was chapter one, um, and then it was awesome. But um, I grew up in Japan. I was a missionary kid there. Um, my parents were missionaries in Japan, so it was, it was pretty cool, and I was always in trouble. Do we have, where's my troublemakers at this morning? There you go. You're not ashamed to lift your hand up. Okay. Just own it. It's all right. Um, I was always in trouble. I was, um, I was the kind of kid that your, the good Christian parents don't want their kids hanging out with. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, we, one summer, my friends and I, we got this, um, this three-man slingshot that shoots water balloons. You guys seen those before? Shoot like a water balloon like 300 yards. It's pretty amazing. Um, I don't even know why they're legal. It's like a weapon of mass destruction. You guys, if you're, if you're still upset about Pearl Harbor, just, just realize that Japan got Ron Hudson for 10 years. Okay, so that kind of pays it all back. It's, it's, um, it's even now. But um, we would go and we, we would shoot water balloons at passing taxis. And um, this was working out brilliantly. It was so much fun. We'd shoot them and then we'd go hide in the bushes until this one guy just stops and gets out of his car. He's like... And he's like all yelling at us in Japanese and stuff. And um, fortunately, we didn't speak enough, and he didn't go check out our mom and uh, tell her what we had been doing. This other thing we did, we lived in this town called Karizawa, which is in Nagano, which is where they had the Winter Olympics like a long time ago. Um, so Karizawa is this like resort town. Think of like the strip district in Pittsburgh, like times a thousand. Okay, so no cars, just back-to-back, wall-to-wall people, shops, like ice cream stands, all kinds of uh, souvenir shops, like just people milling around, like ex- experiencing all the awesome culture of Japan. And what we would do is we'd s- stand like a block away with our three-man slingshot, and we would launch water balloons over the buildings into, <laughs> into the crowds of people. <laughs> it was awesome. It was so cool. So I'm that kid. Um, I, I remember one time, right before we came back to the States on furlough, when missionaries every few years, they got to come back to America so that we don't go crazy. Obviously, it doesn't always work. Um, but <laughs> we, we came back to the States, and we stayed with this missionary family for like three, four days. And so we were staying at their church, and their church was cool. You could go up to the roof, and it was flat on the roof. And so we, we camped out up there. We put a tent up there. We talked our parents into letting us camp out up there. And the one stipulation was you have to stay on the roof at night and sleep in the tent. You're not allowed to, like, go out running all over the city, you know. So, of course, every night we would get up and we would go, like, roam the city and, like, <laughs> explore people's backyards and um, use binoculars. And it was, it was a lot of fun. So one night, the last night, we decided we were going to go to this cemetery in Japan that is famous for people committing suicide, okay? Like hundreds of people a year commit suicide there. Um, they just like hang themselves at this hanging tree. And so we're like, it'll be so awesome if we go there at like midnight to this hanging tree, you know? It'll be so cool. It'll be this adventure. So we go to the hanging tree and um, it was pretty uneventful. It wasn't that cool. It wasn't not as, as cool as it sounded like it was going to be. So we start walking home. And in the distance, we see some headlights. And my friends are like, that's my dad. And I'm like, no, this can't be your dad. It's like 2 in the morning. He gets closer. And then Mr. Brigette, this missionary guy who's like as tall or taller than Zach Ellsworth, he comes and he's got his finger in my face. You! Like, there's all these other kids there. Like, and he's like pointing right at me, Ron Hudson. You! My kids don't act like this when they're not around. You know, it's like... So I, I was kind of that kid, and it wasn't that I was rebelling against anything, really. It wasn't that I was, like, hated my parents or authority, and I was, like, trying to act out. I just enjoyed all the wrong things in life. Um, so it really, it really made a huge impact when certain people came into my life, and it's like they, they got me. It's like they understood me when everyone else didn't. Um, I remember my third grade teacher, Miss Caldwell. She was like one of the first authority figures in my life that kind of got me, that I didn't just write sentences the whole entire time in class and sit in the corner, you know. She like got me. She could like see 
me, like as a little kid and understand like this guy wants to learn. Um, I remember John Edwards, who was a, another missionary in Japan who started a teen's Bible study in his home and he would invite me over, annoying Ron, and, and we would hang out and play Stratego, you know, and he would spend time with me. I remember Ron Howard who worked for high school born againers in Japan and I could call him up on the phone and he would ride a train for two hours to meet me somewhere where we could sit and have a 20 minute conversation because I was going through something in my teen years. I remember Dan Brown, not the one who wrote the book. And Ron Howard is not the same Ron Howard of the happy days, okay. But it's interesting, like all these people. <laughs> Dan Brown, um, I, I went to missionary camp one year and, and I did the most horrible things at that camp and he would pull me aside and say, Ron, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. I remember Alan Owens who brought me to Pennsylvania who said, you can come here and stay. I remember Mark and Tammy Uris who let me live in their house for three years. I was supposed to like stay there for a couple weeks and three years later I moved out. Um, so <laughs> these people would come into my life and there was, something, there was something about them, it was like they were from a different planet because everybody else in my life would just write me off and um, kind of push me to the side. But these people, they understood what I was dealing with and they loved me in spite of me. And there was something very special about them that I never really understood until years later. And I wanna share that with you today because I think that's what 1 Peter chapter four is talking about that these people had. Um, it felt like I was with Jesus when I was with them. So look at 1 Peter chapter four. We're gonna start in verse number seven. And I'm reading in an ESV. I'm not sure what this is, but it's probably close to the same. It says, um, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And we'll stop right there for a second. I wanna talk through this a little bit. First, I wanna look at um, verse number eight, because that's where I'm gonna kinda focus in on. And you'll notice it says, above all. That means this is the most important talk of the day. That's a joke, okay? You can laugh, it's all right. <laughs> but it's true. Um, it says above all, above all, that means this is super important, okay? Peter's like, this is the end of his, his book, he's like, this is super, super important. I want you to key in on this because this is really important. Um, of all the things that I could tell you, this is, this is the most important thing I could tell you. And he says, keep, keep loving, keep loving. And we'll just pause right there and look at keep loving. What does that mean to keep doing something? It means to prioritize it. It means to prioritize it. Um, it means we're supposed to be loving. We all know we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? You guys get that. But something happens that makes loving continually difficult, right? People like Ron Hudson, people like other people in your life that are just a pain, who are annoying and you just, you just can't seem to, to deal with. It says prioritize this principle at the very top. Everything else should be governed by this principle. And it says don't stop. Keep loving. In fact, um, you could illustrate this by a, a song that came out the year I was born in 1981. It was a single released on the album Escape by the band Journey. By the band Journey. Don't stop believing. You guys into it? Tough crowd, okay. Anyways, we'll just move on from that, you know, okay. Um, but no, seriously, don't stop. Because what's gonna happen is people will give you plenty of reasons to stop loving them. If you don't believe that, just hang out with anybody for long enough. They will give you plenty of reasons to stop loving them. And you don't need to stop. You need to keep loving people. And not only do you need to keep loving people, but you need to do it earnestly. That means you gotta push. That means it's gonna be difficult. That means you're gonna have to push through some pain and some suffering. And what happens is when someone acts unlovable, we pull back. We pull back. On some level, we pull back a little bit. Now, we're good Christians, so we don't pull back all the way. We don't just completely remove like love. We don't come out and say, I mean, well, some of you on Facebook, I hate this person, they're horrible. Okay, that's another thing. But most of us, most of us will just pull back a little bit to where we're loving them internally but it's not messy, okay? It's, I'm loving them internally, but I, it's not really affecting me, it's not really hurting me, it's not earnest, okay? I'm keeping it, like I'm still in there, I'm still got the love going on, but it's not, it's not hurting me. For instance, the guy that smells in church, okay? Um, instead of giving him a big hug like you would other people, 
you end up, hey, how you doing? You give the wave, you know. God bless you, good to see you, you know. How about uh, the person who always asks you for money? So instead of saying no, instead of having healthy boundaries in your life and saying no, I'm not gonna help you with money, to avoid the conversation, you just don't talk to them. You just don't talk to them. What about the person in your life that has the craziest stuff going on? They have drama, they have hurt, they have pain, they have sickness, they have death, they have all kinds of stuff going on, so much so that it's just emotionally overwhelming to be around them, right? And you don't have any answers. Like you look for scripture, like I wanna share this with you and make you feel better. None of it works. It, you have no answers to help this person and it's just so emotionally taxing to be around them that what you do, instead of calling them up to say, how are you doing? Let's get some coffee. You just say, I'll pray for them during my devotions. Because you don't wanna go the full step of loving them earnestly. That's what we do, we pull back a little bit. I'm still loving them, like they're on my list, yo. Right there, pray for them right after I pray for Aunt Bertha's like mole, you know. It's right there on the list. But we don't engage with them. We don't put a lot of effort into it. What about the person that betrayed you? The backstabbing scum? Yes. You just got a face, right? <laughs> what about the person that betrayed you? No way am I gonna care about them. What will people think? What will people think if they see me hugging my gay neighbor in the driveway because he told me his mom died and he asked me to pray for him? What will that say about me? What will people think? So we pull back a little bit and, and love at a healthy Christian distance. And that's not earnest. There's nothing earnest about that. I don't even know if that's still loving. Maybe a technicality. But it's certainly not the full brunt of verse eight. Keep loving one another earnestly. And the thing is, why would we do this? Why would we do this? Oh, sure, it's in the Bible, so yeah, we gotta do that. Great job with your Christian school answer. Um, but I like to know a little bit of why God is, is asking us to do things. And he says, he says, because love covers a multitude of sins. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Above all, most important thing, keep loving one another earnestly, like work hard at it, because love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that great? No. I know what you're thinking. It's not great. I don't want love to cover their sins. I want them to pay because they stab me in the back, because they smell bad, because they have all these issues and they kind of deserve to not be loved. I certainly don't want to just cover over whatever they've done and what's going on in their life. Like this person has used me, this person has abused me. There's all kinds of issues. There's all kinds of reasons. Remember, there's reasons why we stop loving people. Legitimate reasons. So is this a really good answer? We don't want any cover-ups. I want to take you to verse number 10. If we could scroll ahead to verse number 10 magically, that would be awesome. Um, verse number 10 of 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And I'm going to get back to the whole cover-up thing. But you've got to understand this first. You've got to understand that we are stewards of God's grace. The people who kept loving me when I was unlovable, when I was doing all the things I'm not supposed to do, when I was a bad influence on people, the people who kept loving me through those moments were stewards of God's grace. They loved me earnestly and they understood this principle. You see, God has made a deposit of his varied grace into you. Every single one of you. If you're saved, if you've asked Jesus into your heart, if you have believed the gospel and received forgiveness of your sins, you have gotten an enormous deposit of God's grace into your life. You've received an enormous deposit. Each of us is given a portion of God's grace. And I love how it says varied. What does that mean? I'm like looking it up. I'm like, what does it mean by varied? It means this. It means God's grace is varied. You can't define it. You can't contain it. You can't put your finger on it. But we're called to steward it. We are called to steward God's grace. What does that mean? Well, first off, 
unless you're a police officer working for the government, as Dana told us in the last time, we're stewards of God's grace, not God's wrath. That's kind of controversial sometimes, right? Like right there in 1 Peter, it's telling me I'm a steward of God's grace, when a lot of times I'd rather be a steward of God's wrath. I'd rather tell people what I really think God should tell them and yell at them and when I'm called to steward God's grace. Unless you're a police officer, we're supposed to steward God's grace and many of us would rather steward the wrath. You're a steward of God's grace. So I gotta ask you this morning, what are you doing with the deposit you've been given? What are you doing with the deposit of God's grace that you have been given? Let's step back and look at that phrase back in um, verse number seven. It says, love covers. Right here. Love covers. What does that mean? What does that mean? Love covers. I've wrestled with this a lot, you know, because there's a lot of other pastors listening. You can't really say it wrong. They're going to judge you and stuff. But I, I thought back to this thing that happened at church. My youth group is a, is a bunch of misfit unlovables, I got to tell you. We, um, I live right across the street from Persian Court, okay? <gasps> oh, I know, right? Um, it's, <laughs> so we pick up students in Persian Court. We pick up students in Tuskegee, which is the projects right behind us. We go to Bearwood. We go to about five different places all over the east end of town. We pick them up on our bus, and they are, they're wild. They're wild, okay? And one night, I think it was a Saturday night after we had a service, um, two of my students were fighting in the hallway and one of the girls like ran, it was a girl and a guy, and they ran, the girl ran into the office and like tried to pull the glass door of the office shut, you know? So the guy comes running after her um, and like grabs the door and she like slams it back on him, okay? So they're fighting between this glass door, what could go wrong, right? So <laughs> she slams it back in his face and he puts up his hands to block it and psh, <laughs> the door spiders. Now, I had those, like, metal things in it, which are cool, so it didn't, like, shatter all over the place and cut people all to pieces, um, which I'm thankful for, because that would have been a whole issue with parents. But so, it's like spider web of glass, you know? And so I come in, and we're like, it was like two minutes before we're getting on the bus. In this door. I'm like, we almost made it all night, <laughs> you know? And so I look at this door, and I'm like, what am I gonna do now? And so the kid who broke it, he just, like, goes storming out. He's He's like, they're never gonna. I could see on his face, like what he's thinking. I'm never coming back here. I'm in so much trouble. So I go out in the parking lot and I grab him by the shoulders and he's just like, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, you know, I, I, know, I'm, I know I'm in trouble. I know I'm in trouble. He's trying to make all the kind of excuses and everything. And um, I just grab him by the shoulder and say, dude, I love you. You are worth more than 100 glass doors. So then he gets on the bus and goes home. The next morning, I come into church, Sunday morning. It's right there by the front door. Big broken glass door, you know. And I know people are going to come in, and not that people in our church hate my students, but you're always going to have that, right? They're unlovable. That's why the Bible is commanding us to keep loving, because they're going to do stuff that's unlovable. And so I know, like, all the members are going to come in, they're going to see this broken door and be like, there they go again, you know, those teens, those rotten, you know, miscreants or whatever. And so I'm like, what do I do? You know, this is, this is a mess. Like, they're all going to be pointing their finger at this one kid, and he doesn't need that. He doesn't need that. So I got a Sharpie, and I went over to the door, and I wrote in big letters, Ron Hudson. Cross the cracks. Just left it at that. So everybody comes in. Oh, Ron, what'd you do to the door? You know, what's going on, man? Oh, way to go, Ron. You know, I just let it go. Just let it go. And we led worship. And then at some point during worship, I told them what was going on. I said, the door was broken, and I didn't do it, but
But you all thought I did because I wrote my name on it. And so the truth is that we're all broken. Every single one of us are broken. I'm a broken person, you're a broken person. And Jesus Christ came into your life and wrote his name all over your brokenness. That's what he did on the cross. He's, he's hanging there with his name all over Ron Hudson's sin. All over your sin. That's what he did. He wrote his name with his blood. Love, love covered your sin when Jesus wrote his name all over it with his own blood. Isn't that grace? Isn't that exactly what grace is? He like, he took, well, like, took responsibility for what I did when he was pure. He didn't even have a guarantee that I would accept him. And he still said, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. That's the very definition of grace, God's unmerited favor. His extravagant love lavished on unlovable and broken people. Now, you probably haven't taken very many notes because I don't speak in a cool outline format. But I want you to write this down. One thing. Here's the point. Cultivate love by investing grace. Cultivate love by investing grace. We're stewards of a deposit of grace God has given us. So your responsibility as a manager of the deposit that God has put in you is to invest it. And how do you do that? How do you do that? I'll write this down too. Show up in someone else's world and write your name all over their mess. Show up in someone else's world and write your name all over their mess. That's what the people understood who showed up in my world when I didn't deserve it. When I, I, I deserved to be written off because I was messing up and doing all the wrong things. And they would go to great lengths to show up and have a conversation with me and say, it's going to be okay, Ron. Let me pray with you. Let me take you out to lunch. Let me... Let me spend some time with you. Go ahead, live in my basement for three years. You know, they showed up. They made deposits of grace from their own supply. And in doing so, they wrote their name on my life. Now, I want you to imagine this. How many of you have ever been to an amusement park? Okay, some of you guys. Some of you guys are like missing out on what life is all about. You might want to check that out. Um, <laughs> you, have you ever tried to leave an amusement park after you got in? And they stamp your hand. You know what I'm talking about? They might do this at bars too, but I don't, I don't go to bars, so I wouldn't know. This is me judging you. <laughs> um, so they stamp your hand. I remember this as a kid, and I put the stamp on. I'm like, you didn't, it didn't work, bro. You need to like, do another one because I don't see anything. He's like, no, 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 there's a cool light. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> and so he's like, here. And I put my hand under, and then I see this like, thing light up on my hand, you know, like Kennywood or you know, Cedar Point or Six Flags or whatever it was. And, and I think about that, and I wonder, when we get to heaven and we stand before God, and he judges our life, when I stand before him in his presence, in his light, I can imagine that I'm going to have written on me Jonathan Edwards, Dan Brown, Mark and Tammy Harris, Alan Owens. It's going to be clear as day, their signature on my life. Because they invested the deposit of grace that God had put in them into me. So everything I do, all of the nights that I hang out with teenagers and the, I show up because the cops arrested one of my students at school, all the stuff that I do to invest in students' lives is part of their account because they invested in me. They invested in me. And I bet every single one of you, when you stand before God, you would have the same thing. You would have names of people who invested in you, who were good stewards of the grace that God had given them, and they invested it back into your heart, into your life, and showed up when you didn't deserve it, and talked to you when you were that annoying kid, or came when everybody else had written you off, and you were a mess, and they showed up and wrote their name 
in your mess to say, I'll identify with you, I'll sit with you, I'll be with you, I will risk my reputation to be your friend. So the question is, who will have your name on their life? You wanna cultivate love, the love of God in you? Then do what God did, invest, invest. Cultivate love by investing grace. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for who you are. You're awesome. You have given us so much that we just don't even deserve. To identify with us, to show up in our world, to take on human form, to leave your glory, to come and write your name on our hearts. Jesus, you are, you are awesome. And God, we thank you. We praise you for the deposit of grace you've made in each one of our lives to bring us to this point. Lord, I pray that we would, we would invest and reinvest, that we would find people and we would write our names into their lives like you have in ours so that they can come to know you so that the Christian brother who's struggling, who doesn't think they're gonna make it, so they can figure out how to walk and be sanctified and continue on their journey. Lord, we pray that we would be faithful to cultivate love in our hearts by investing grace. In Jesus' name, amen.